For our scripture this morning, I'll be reading from John chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here to me. Thank you, may be seated. Sorry, I meant to. No, I'm sorry. Stay. I'm lost. My bad. <laughs> Remain standing for the word of God. <laughs> okay. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say that the Lord needs it and will return it soon. So the two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others lay spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and he noticed a fig tree and a full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, The scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves." When the leading priests and the teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning on how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture. Now you may be seated. All right, there's a lot to take in here. I could have broken this into three sermons, but they need to go together. And can I just say, hearing that, and especially for those who maybe aren't uh, accustomed to church and grown up, seeing passion plays and so forth, it's a little strange. There's some strange things wedged in between these events, such as the fig tree. So we're going to unpack this today, and um, there's a lot to, uh, to grab hold of, a lot of truth here. Jesus, this is, if you're writing titles down, this is Jesus cleanses the temple and you. So uh, what we're going to look at this morning is the character of Jesus and how that character should reside, reflect in us, the power he brings and how he produces that character in you and me. Uh, We see his character in this triumphal entry and we see it in him cleansing the temple and we see it actually in the fig tree, in the curious event of the fig tree. So couple points to bring out here. The significance of, in, in this translation said, colt, don- the donkey. All right? I remember as a kid seeing those passion plays where uh, people would ride in, you know, portraying Jesus with the palm, palms and Palm Sunday, think Palm Sunday, and, and the, the donkey. And just kind of got used to it, I guess, as a kid, but I did used to sit and think, well, why did Jesus ride a donkey? Uh, Jesus always had a point with everything. And sometimes the point was just to make us go, what? Huh? To question the way we operate, the way we think. And when I say we, the world. It says in verse 7, Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. Imagine the, the disciples and the followers of Jesus. I mean, a lot of them had this wrong. And this is what Jesus was constantly doing, explaining, look, you don't have a clue. You think you get it, but you don't get it. Even in this act of the donkey, he, this is what he's doing. 
They're building up. This is the king. He's going to set everything right, everything that's broken. And remember, if these were times that look a lot like ours. War, uh, men oppressing other men and, and people, bad, sin, corruption, you name it. Jesus was going to straighten it out. And the disciples were convinced of this. His followers were convinced of this, but they didn't necessarily know the how. They were guessing Mighty, might, military, triumphal king is going to crush. We're going to overthrow Rome. No more oppression by the Romans. No more, no more of them bringing us down and owning us and taking advantage of us. So here they are building this up. And Jesus is about to make his way in on a mighty donkey. Right? It kind of lands on you the same way it landed on them. The, the word here, actually, in the Greek is polos, I think polo shirts, where it means it could be a baby horse. I mean, that's, that's powerful, right? Come riding in triumphantly on a baby horse. Little tiny, I think of those little tiny half horses that are, you know, very small, but it was most likely a donkey. It could go both ways. And other texts talk about him being on a donkey. So it, it lands on us the same way. This is the king of kings. You expect majesty, right? Not a donkey. There's a purpose here. Listen, Jonathan Edwards, who was in 1738, this sermon, I'm going to read a, a snippet of his sermon here. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was called by even secular folks one of the most brilliant men to ever live. And I would say if you grew up, all my references, sadly, guys, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so they, they don't land with some of you guys. I, I'd say he's Yoda smart, okay? Anybody with me there? He, he, Jonathan Edwards was Yoda smart. Um, if you don't know that reference, sorry. Um, but a great sermon he wrote called, uh, was written uh, based on Revelation 5, 5 through 6. I want to read a, a portion of that called The Excellency of Christ. And again, this is, he's brilliant. So I'm going to um, borrow from him for a moment. Listen to what he said. And again, this is in 1738, hence the language. It's about the vision of John in a in portion of Reve, in Revelation 5, 5 through 6. It says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah, the root of David, has triumphed to open the book. So I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb looking as if, as if it had been slain. You see, John is told to look for a lion. He looks for the lion, and there in the midst of the throne, a lamb. Edwards proceeds to say this, A lion excels in strength and in majesty of his appearance and voice. A lamb excels in meekness and is sacrificed for human clothing and food. But Jesus Christ is both, both because of the diverse excellencies of both lion and lamb are wonderfully met in him. Indeed, there is in Jesus Christ a conjunction of such truly diverse excellencies as otherwise would be utterly incompatible in the same subject. And I'll explain this in a moment. There do meet in Christ infinite highness and infinite accessibility, infinite justice yet infinite grace, infinite glory yet infinite humility, infinite majesty, infinite transcendent meekness, absolute sovereignty yet perfect submission, infinite all sufficiency in himself yet entire trust and dependence on God. He's a lion, he's a lamb, he's a rock, He's a pearl, he's a mighty captain, he's a tender lover, he's a fragile flower, he's a mighty tree of life. That's some words, right? Jesus combines these character traits in and of himself. Everything we're hoping for, everything we're longing for, everything we hope our friends and neighbors are, he is. And Edwards is saying basically they can never be combined in a single person, but they are in him. I'll show that later, guys, at the end of the service. We'll go back to that. Traits we would consider basically exclusive, mutually exclusive, are in his character and nature. So think about this. I'm a fan of um, history, and I'm intrigued by the wars of our world, the, the wars that we've gone through as a nation. And one of the phrases that is common to our, our soldiers is this phrase. As we're thinking about might, as we're thinking about warriors, if you think about war, even right now, right? A lot going on in our world. We're in wars. 
War is hell. Now, that is not just figurative. I believe that is the closest thing to hell this world sees. It's destructive. And many of our, my heroes in here, Mr. Louis, Mr. John, and so many of you guys that were in the middle of war would echo the same thing. It's, just, it's terrible. And they would not wish it on anybody. They wouldn't wish you to be a part of it. Most would desire to never see it again. And as we think about, uh, right now, I'm, I'm in, encompassing World War II a bit. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, the, the Band of Brothers story. Anybody ever seen that series or uh, know the story of Richard Winters? Uh, Dick Winters was a prominent military officer who served in World War II. And they made a whole series about his leadership. And this was the, the guys who went in on D-Day um, after that and, and went into basically overtake Hitler's nest. And um, my grandfather, it's interesting to me because he was in the, the tank part of it, right behind them uh, in the armored division and uh, followed that same trajectory and their same path. But Richard Winters, who was a man who uh, led, and many, many strategies are still based on his, his mind, his strategic mind that they use today. Uh, he personally took over 50 Nazi lives and probably injured, said, up to 100 uh, as, as a leader. He was on the front lines leading his men. And listen to this quote. Uh, in this series, there's a documentary about him, and he's being interviewed. And he says, that night, the first time, he said, that night I took time to thank God for seeing me through the day of days and prayed I would make it through D plus one. And if somehow... I managed to get home again. I promised God and myself that I would find a quiet piece of land somewhere and spend the rest of my life in peace. That's what he said in the middle. The first day he really hit battle head on. That's what he said. That's what he contemplated. Do you not think during World War II and in all wars that Satan is not a part of that? Satan wants to destroy. Satan wants to tear down. Satan wants to ruin humanity. God renews. God restores. You do, not, do we not think that Satan was whispering in Hitler's ear the same thing he was whispering in Adam and Eve's ear? You can be God. You can do it. You know, Hitler thought he was right. He thought he was doing the world a favor. So Jesus didn't work this way. And here's a prophecy 600 years prior about Jesus. Listen to this. In Zechariah 9, 9 through 10, we have that up there. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all weapons used in battle and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. What's the saying about Jesus? He will crush war, but he doesn't do, do it the way we expect. He will end destruction, but he doesn't do it the way we expect. He will kill death, but he doesn't do it the way we expect him to do it, right? This is what he's picturing. This is the picture of riding in, 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 into Jerusalem on the donkey. This is, this is the picture. The king doesn't roll the way we roll. He doesn't think the way we think. Majesty is not what we think is majesty. Confidence is not what we think is confidence. Jesus is the most of all these things. He is the objective point of reference for all these things. He conquers, but not the way the world does. So you see this picture, this odd little picture of Jesus coming in, being worshipped on the donkey. The king of kings rides not a white horse here, but a donkey. This is his character. Secondly, we see this temple chaos, all right? Some of you have seen this in the movies before and, and portraying Jesus. He walks in, and this is Jesus kicking butt, right? That, that's, that's how it's kind of portrayed. And this kind of, some people take it and go, this is my right to, 
to, to get feisty with people too, right? Not at all. Listen, listen what, what, what he was doing here in the temple. Now let me give you some background on what temple means in tabernacle in this day. So in the Garden of Eden, there's a lot to unpack here. Stay with me. In the Garden of Eden, uh, we were cut off from God's presence because of the fall, because of wanting to go our own way. And essentially we were removed from God's presence, but he didn't leave us alone. He put swords up to keep us out. Cherubim, angels guarding the Garden of Eden, and we were removed from God's presence, but he didn't leave us alone. He gave us a place for his presence. He was with us, and he established the temple. And the temple was where his presence ab abided. Uh, and they would enter the temple. So we get to the temple, and you see this progression. I'm not going to give an exhaustive uh, explanation of it, but they enter in the temple through sacrifice, just like the swords at, at the garden. If you enter in there because of our injustice, because of our sin, because of our stain, uh, it brought death. And to enter into God's presence, things die. And we see this in our life. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Anything, for something to live, something dies. It's the, the pattern of the world. Pick an apple off a tree, it dies. Right? That good hamburger you're enjoying to keep you alive and sustained that you might eat for lunch, it's gone. It dies. For us to sustain life, things die. But watch this. Jesus is going to change things. How do we get in the God's presence? How do we enter God's presence and be with him through the temple? But it demands sacrifice. So Jesus enters the temple where God's presence is supposed to be, walking into the temple, and the cleansing of the temple shows his power, but it shows much more than that. In the first part of the temple that he's walking into, I want you to see this scene that's going on. This is the place where that, is, that is accessible to the non-Jews, the Gentiles, all right? Basically for the, for the world, for God to be accessible to people other than the Jews, the court of the Gentiles was the largest section of the temple, and it became a business operation. Thousands of people were buying and selling. It was corrupt, uh, much more than just animals, according to many scholars and, and, and historians. Think Wall Street. You know the chaos you see there in Wall Street? Times 10. Uh, there were thousands upon thousands of people there. Historian Josephus mentioned that during the Passover week, typically 25,000 lambs were bought, sold, and sacrificed there. So hundreds, thousands of people coming and going, and it was corruption and profit, and it became a circus of sorts. And Jesus comes in this scene, flipping furniture, tables, and most likely people too, physically removing people. And when questioned about his actions, he declared that the temple should be a house of prayer for Gentiles and all nations. This is the place where people were supposed to be meeting with God and hearing about God, and it became a circus. It became something for men's gain. This act of him flipping the table shocked the listeners, shocked the hearers, because their expectation of the Messiah would be that he would remove the foreigners he would join with them. And instead, he was calling them out, calling for unity. You see that? This was the place the foreigners were supposed to be hearing about God. And he corrects them. Furthermore, he was challenging their sacrificial system, allowing Gentiles to have direct access to God through prayer. Things were changing. Jesus was changing things. And the temple was where God's presence was supposed to be. It didn't look like it was going on, did it? Right? A little more like a county fair or Wall Street. And in the garden where we were cut off from God's presence, we were, Jesus was making us a way back. And he's showing up saying that this, I'm the temple. I'm the temple. See, God provides us a way and we even break that through the tabernacles, through the temple. So Jesus is going to come save the day, make things right, conquer. He's the temple. And the significance, watch this, of the fig tree. Now, this is a little weird one, right? 
How many of you just skimmed over this one and go, hmm? That's kind of strange. It's a weird moment, but it's a teaching moment. This is how Jesus rolled. Even the donkey was a teaching moment. It's, it's a little strange. Figs are diseased here, not producing. He goes out. He, he seems to really be hungry and want to go out and see this tree. And kind of, Jesus seems kind of mad. It's really not a good look for Jesus if you're, if you're reading this. But he's trying to teach something here. I want you to see this. As he goes out here and engages this fig tree, he's leaving a place where they were doing it all wrong, where men had broken things. God set up a way to access him, and, and we broke it. We corrupted it, as we do so many things. And then his disciples are walking with him. Here he is teaching them another lesson. To simplify this, he was saying this fig tree should be producing, leaves, producing fruit, sustenance to eat, but it's not. It looks like it from a distance, but you get close up to it, and it's empty. It's essentially diseased. And what he's basically teaching us here is our religiosity is the same thing. And we were whitewashed tombs. We might look right on the outside, but on the inside, we're empty. We're dying if we haven't truly been made alive from the inside out. This is what's going on in the temple. Works righteousness. Trying to make our own rules, our own way to get to God. And Jesus is saying, don't you get it? To the point of frustration, it seems, right? Between verses 11 and 15 here, this little mention of the fig tree. Between his coming to the temple and his returning, you have this parable. This, in, this incident, not parable, of the fig tree, where he's simply saying hollow religious religios, religiosity gets you nowhere. He's making it personal, y'all. So he's clearing out the temple, then he's making it personal to us. This is what we look like when we live our own way, when we do our own thing, when we make God a projection of ourselves. There's got to be visible change in us. There will be visible change in us. Character made new in us. So how does this land on you? What does this do? I set you up two stories there. Maybe dig, dug in a little bit deeper to the weight of those and how they were landing on the hearers of that time. The significance here is Jesus is saying live boldly. Live confidently knowing you are loved. Knowing you are valued by the king. The lion and the lamb. Here we see this picture of him. Both mighty warrior yet serving lamb. Jesus took that sword that cut off access to God. Jesus took the sword. This is the whole point of his death. This is the whole point of where he's going to take that sword. And it doesn't end there. That sword that will cut off you and me and destroy us all. Death. He broke the sword. The sword is broken in the process. Death is dead because of Christ. This is where he's going. This is where he's leading us. And you don't have to taste it. Put that slide back up there, John, if you don't mind. Let's look at these. Look at the character and nature of Jesus, according to Jonathan Edwards. And of course, these are attributes of him in the Bible. Infinite highness, infinite accessibility. You see that? He's great. He's mighty. He doesn't need us, but he's accessible. He lends an ear to us. Infinite justice, yet infinite grace. Infinite justice so much we can't get around him. We can't be in his presence. If we do, we're dead. Just by our sin and by our being our own little idol kings. But yet he's gracious. So much that you don't get death anymore. He took, he took it on us. He takes our place. Infinite glory and infinite humility. See that, see that and in the middle I want you to catch here? It's not one or the other in Jesus. And think of humans in this. Think of humans on this spectrum. We're usually way over on one side or the other, right? Infinite majesty, an infinite transcendent meekness. So he's great, yet he's mild. Absolute sovereignty and perfect submission. What? Those two don't work the same, right? All sufficient in himself and entire trust and dependence on God. Did you see that? You saw that in the person of Jesus. That he, he knew everything. And we see a magnificent moment when he, when he tells disciples, go get the colt. Like that was a God move there. 
Like, they'll, they'll give it to you. He knew what was going to happen. He, he planned it. He wrote it. Yet you see him praying to the Father and showing dependence on God, even though he was God. <sighs> right? Lion, yet the lamb. The mighty conquering predatorial lion. Think of that. The lamb who is typically wool and food. Meek, mild, rock and a pearl, mighty captain and tender lover, fragile flower and a mighty tree of life. Now, notice with humans, we usually are either or, or way over on one stream, extreme or the other in all areas and characters of our life, things we want. We want to be confident. We want to seek confidence, but usually when we get there, we put other people down, right? We want to be humble, but when we live in humility, often we're, we feel worthless and no good on our own. When we live with a works righteousness, like we got to earn our way, we're always being crushed. These traits are found in no one person other than Jesus. You see that? We are always usually an either or. We're struggling one way or another, trying to get back to this place. And Jesus, I, I've said it before, lives in the, has us live in this beautiful tension. That's where we should be. There's a beautiful tension there. In all other religions, in all other worldviews, even secularism, we have a tendency towards one or the other extreme. We get two. In, 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 what I'm saying, T-O-O, in one way or another. If we want to be a giver, we, we start giving, and we sometimes can be in that moment of giving, we get selfish, like pat ourselves on the back. If we don't embrace what Jesus is showing us here, to center on Him, We go to one extreme or the other. Jesus reproduces his power and nature in you and me. This is a paradoxical thing in, in the character of Jesus. Combining traits that you would never see in one person, but will be reproduced in you. And that's how you know you're becoming a, a not just, watch this, a nicer person, or more disciplined, or more moral person, but you're actually having the life of Christ reproduced in you. So how does this play out in your life? Seeing Jesus described that way, seeing his character and see his nature. If you're a fearful person, you can overcome that. If you're an anxious person, you can overcome that. See, there should be change happening in our life. This is what Jesus is saying about the fig tree. Looks nice on the outside, but inside it's dead. There should be change happening. If you're ill-tempered, you can overcome that. If you're short-tempered, you can overcome that. If you're fearful, you can overcome that. But not you, you alone. It's in Him. Whatever it is, whatever weakness, if you're an addict, you can overcome that. But on our own, we can't. On our own, we're broken. On our own, we're one way or the other. We are two one way or the other. But he calls us to reflect his character and his nature. When Jesus died, the temple veil was torn. We're getting there. He's on his way. You heard that. They want to kill him. What happened? The temple veil was torn. There was no more temple. He's the temple. He's the temple. And he gives his character and nature in you through the power of the Holy Spirit residing in you. And then the scripture goes on to say, you, your body is a temple. What does the temple mean? It's where God's presence resides resides. Do you get that? Do you see the power in that? He didn't leave us in Genesis 3. He didn't leave us, you're out, you're cut off from me, 
Have a good day. He didn't leave us there, guys. That's the good news. He's fixing it, has fixed it, and will fix it. That's the gospel. You can be the place where this God we're talking about, this mighty warrior, this roaring lion resides. And that's power. And I don't think we access it and know it. We're learning, but we have no idea what that means. He took the sword. Not only the sword, he, did he take it, but it was broken that killed him. The sword that should take you and me no longer destroy us. You know what the scriptures are saying by this? Live. Live fully alive knowing he has taken the sword on your behalf. And it doesn't end there. It's done. Death is broken. Death is defeated. War, as we think about that going on, the destruction, the depravity of man, it's gone on. It's always going on. It shows what we do being our own kings. That's, that's, that's just a perfect example of it. It's destruction. The story of stories is Satan wants to tear down humanity. Satan wants to destroy. Satan likes to see humans dead. Satan likes destruction. We know there's absolute evil out there. We know it's, it's alive and well. And Jesus came not to leave us in that, but to ultimately destroy evil once and for all. Live in that, knowing that. That is our hope in our life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the story, these teachable lessons uh, that we should be confident in. In a world of chaos, you are perfect. You are good. And you give it to us. You give us your character and your nature, everything we want. May we not try to do it our, on our own because then we become the fig tree. We become empty. We become leaning one way or the other too much. God, give us that alignment in you that you might be the center. We're not the center. We don't center ourselves, as some philosophies say. We focus on you. You're the finish line. So may we aim to you, Lord, and thank you for giving us. As you say, the scripture shows us that the Holy Spirit comes and resides, that God's presence lives inside of us. May we reflect your character and nature. May we overcome the things that pull us down. As you say we can through you. Thank you for the gift of salvation to know you. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, maybe been trying to do this on their own, Relig religiosity, we might look like things are together on the outside, but the insides are a mess. Lord, may we step towards you. May we surrender to you. May we ask forgiveness. May we not remain cut off from you, but take the entrance to know you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and sing. I'm going to be in the front to pray with you. Always willing to talk to you. Follow Christ.
can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none, there is none, there is none like you. That's my fault. Don't look at them. <laughs> I think there's anything we're leaving with today is God is accessible. God is personal. This is unique to this story. You hear that? We don't have to seek. We don't have to work. We don't have to uh, go trying to figure it out. And, and I, I watched a friend of mine that was down and out and had struggling uh, in her life. And she's seeking all these things. She's basically making up. Uh, these ways to peace in her life. And it's a formula of a zillion different religions she's borrowed from to find peace. And she's still working at it. Still trying to figure it out. And this is what, I hope you grabbed this this morning. It might have been kind of, some of you might have been tired. It went, whoop, but God's saying, you're not cut off anymore. You don't have to try to figure it out. I'm here. It's accessible to you. Life is accessible. We don't have to be chasing and drawing straws and trying to figure it out. I'm here. That's good news. He's personal. He's it. He's the only one that's personal. Out of all these other beliefs, all these things people are making up, the world, serving the world, serving nature, doesn't care about us. Jesus says he does. Rest in that this morning. Leave with that hope, knowing that everything's broken around us. Broken around us. That's us. He loves us. That's your second sermon for the day. So rest in that. Receive your benediction this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go knowing that he's accessible. He's there. He is a breath, a prayer away in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave, uh...